Welcome to uh, the Homo Ludens podcast. Uh, this isn't the podcast, this is a special no, um, edition of the main show itself uh, with your host, uh, Tavel. Oh, and you're, oh, and you're cutting off, Joe, so I, I need Fred, to... Would you like to introduce <laughs> our special guest? Yes, I would. Uh, so uh, thanks everyone for, for joining. As always, Joe is here and we have a, a special guest uh, with us tonight, uh, Dan Thuro. So I, I say your name in a very French way, so you can correct me if you, <laughs> if, if needed. <laughs> uh, most known among, uh, amongst uh, players for your blog, Space Biff, uh, which is pretty awesome. And tonight we are all together here to play a game that I think you like a lot, Dan. Uh, called Pax Renaissance, and we're going to play the second edition that was released, I think, last year, uh, the second edition by Ion Games. Thanks, Dan, for being here. Thanks, Joe, for doing the intro when I don't know what to say for the intro, so I really appreciate that. Dan, thanks for, for taking the time to teach us the game and, and play together. Uh, but maybe for, for the people who might not know you watching the, the show, can you maybe briefly introduce yourself? Sure, I'd be happy to. My name is Dan Thoreau. I write about board games. I also uh, teach history. And uh, that's actually one of the reasons why I like Pax Renaissance so much is here we have this big, complicated, um, sandboxy game. That in, that in many ways uh, presents very good history, very cosmopolitan history, and in some ways presents very bad history. And I'm always, I'm always interested in the way that games represent history. So I played this game, uh, I played the first edition when it first released, and I had pre-ordered it, and I was very excited to get it, and then my package got lost and um, because it was being imported, and... It was probably one of the the most frustrated, the most frustrated I've ever become with having lost a game because I wanted to try it so badly, and if, it eventually did uh, appear. And this is one of my favorite ga games ever designed. Uh, it's a game that I've written about a few times, and uh, I'm I'm very excited to be here and to play it with you and discuss it. For context, so the one that you pre-ordered originally was this one. So just for, for people to understand, so that was the one that was released by Sierra Madrid Games. I think in, was it in 2015 or something like this? Yeah, something like yeah. that, yeah. And then the, the one that we're gonna play tonight is slightly bigger, but it is the same game. And this is the, the one that we'll be playing. The main differences that you have between those two is that uh, this one contains a board, uh, which is not necessary, but is practical to have. But uh, all, if here the board is card-based, like you can see in a, a lot of other PAX games. And the other thing that I think is really interesting with this one is that uh, it contains a lot more cards than in the original game. I think that makes it interesting because in the original game, some victory conditions were extremely hard to achieve. Uh, because some some one shot events were, I guess, missing, and it made it hard to 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 succeed. For example, holy victory or stuff like this, which is a bit more balanced, uh, from what I understood in the in the um, in the newest version. But I don't know. Then, did you play the two versions of 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 the games, or did you only play the 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 main one with the expansions? I did. I play. I've played both. I don't. I, I don't know if I understand whether it's more balanced or not. You know, having a big card pool makes. Uh, makes it very possible that the, the actions you need will not appear. And so um, so like all of the PAX games, this is very much a game about rolling with your punches and, and trying to make the best of a bad situation. So there are going to be a lot of things that come out that maybe don't help you, and you're going to have to make them work anyway. Uh, and that, that was consistent across editions. And you, Joe, what's your, did you, I know we played our, uh, a bit Pax Renaissance a while ago, but we're pretty much noob. Uh, what, what's your impression of Pax Renaissance so far compared to the other Pax games that you maybe played a bit more? So uh, it's, you know, it's very interesting. There's a lot more uh, kind of stuff, I guess, uh, particularly compared to Premiere, which I played a lot. Um, and one thing that strikes me in particular is you're often very limited in what you can do. So the, the actions on the cards in your, um, your court as such, uh, are often limited to just one one particular region, um, so it's it's a lot harder to to kind of flex your muscles in that way. But then some some very big kind of spectacular things can happen, perhaps, but in some other games as well. So yeah, that's my general impression so far. 
Yeah, and we'll debrief after after the after the game. And as I was saying to Dan, uh, hopefully, because we have a limited amount of time, we hope that Dan can do the teach and beat us in sixty minutes. So then we can have a bit of time for <laughs> uh, for for debriefing after the game. But I guess that's um, that's it for the intro. Uh, let's jump into the game. I will add the image here from the stream. And just for people who are wondering, uh, we are playing the tabletop version uh, of the second edition here. And here is the board. And we are going to explain uh, along uh, the way as we go when we play. Uh, but now I will probably let um, Dan explain us uh, what the game is about uh, and what we're trying to do and who we are within the game. So let's start with the really controversial part. So who are you in this game? So we are going to be playing as uh, you can see them uh, down here and over here. We are Renaissance bankers. And we are trying to uh, establish some sort of preeminence. Like many of the PAX games, there are very different ways that the game can end. But in all of the endings, we have positioned ourselves as in command of the destiny of, of Europe and, and the very near East. So the way that we're going to be going about doing that, this game is going to be very much about spending money in order to make more money, in order to spend it to, again to influence these various cards, which in turn will influence Europe over here. The, the format of the game is pretty simple. We're each going to take turns. It'll just go around the table. There's no uh, crazy phase stuff or anything like that. And on your turn, you're going to take two actions. And those actions at the start of the game are very limited. The, the first action that you can take, and this is going to be the action that you'll probably take most in the game, is just to buy a card. When you buy a card, you're just going to put some coins out and then uh, and buy a card. So like if I came over here and I wanted to buy this card, the handsome, I would put a coin here and here and then take this card. Um, that's so that's very simple. If there's any if there are any coins on that card, I, I get to take them pretty easy. Now, the biggest action in the game is to play a card. And that's because when you have a card and I don't know if you let's see if you want to zoom in on something. Let's pretend I'm going to play this card, the handsome. So I'm over here. Uh, I have picked, unfortunately, the uh, the banker whose name I can't pronounce. Jacques Coeur. 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 Okay. Coeur. Coeur. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I've picked uh, Jacques here. And when I play a card, I am always going to put it into the part of the tableau. I have I'm building two separate tableaus, one to the west and one to the east. And this card, the handsome, he is a card in the east. You can tell because of that little banner, uh, it's black instead of white. Is that a commentary? I don't know. Let's not, let's not get into that. And whenever you play a card, a, a few things are going to happen. So down here, you're going to see that at the bottom of the card, it is going to show some pieces right here. And it's going to show potentially, not always, but it's going to show what we call a one-shot. And this is going to be something that happens immediately upon playing the card. Um, so in this case, the card is in Hungary. You can see that this card belongs to Hungary. And it's going to let us place two knights. And specifically, those knights are green, which means that they are going to be uh, Muslim knights. So these are knights that belong to the forces of Islam. In this case, those knights are going to be waging a jihad in Hungary. There are a whole bunch of one shots um, in this game, and do you want me to go through all of them, or do we want? I think to... we can we can explain them as we go when okay. we yeah when, when we encounter them. But uh, now we have the first one. We can explain the jihad one just to explain what happens when you have a one shot, and then we can yeah we'll we'll explain sure. as we go the other ones. So in this case, uh, if I were to take this card and and play it, I so it shows that I get two knights. Uh, two Islamic knights, and I get them in Hungary. Now, normally when you place pieces in a, in a region, they can only go on these um, spaces that, that indicate there's room for them. Right now, I'm just going to put them here for a moment because uh, we're waging our jihad. So this is one of three holy wars that can happen. And they're all pretty much the same. It's uh, crusade, 
jihad and reformation. And their only big difference is in which color of pieces they use when they happen. So right away, so here I've placed these knights here just as a holding um, thing. And the first thing you need is the heretic. So in this case, oh, we have a Catholic knight, which, which means that we do have a heretic. There's somebody for us to crusade against. Also, when we wage a crusade, normally all of the pieces that we're placing, so in this case, we've got our two Islamic knights uh, against this Catholic knight, but we, al we also get to use any adjacent knights of our type. So we look over here, and in Byzantium, oh, up in Tana, I have another Islamic knight. And down here in Constantinople, we have two more Islamic knights. So this crusade is pretty overwhelming. And when we say adjacent, we could also be bringing stuff over from um, uh, down here, um, the Mamluk Empire. But there are no knights. One of the things this game does that's really cool and it makes it very legible is it uses chess pieces. So these green knights, um, they represent knights, uh, military nobles, whereas the rooks, those are just going to be landed nobles. Um, so they are not going to go off on crusades. So in this case, we could have one-to-one -one losses. So I'm going to look and, well, maybe I want to weaken the Ottoman Empire. So I'm actually, and this is where a lot of the game's uh, trickiness comes in, is nobody directly owns any of these pieces. So I'm going to actually say that it's the knights from Constantinople and the Catholic knights from Buddha who wipe each other out. So one-to-one -one deaths. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take any of the knights, uh, any of the leftover pieces, and they have to go in and occupy these cities. Now, a few things are going to happen now. I am victorious in Hungary. So the first thing that happens is it is going to switch to an Islamic state. Now it is, uh, it, it, the, the jihad has been successful, and so now it has become Islamic. Also, the, uh, the ruler of Hungary, pr presumably the new ruler, is very grateful to me for having, uh, having conducted this jihad. So I, I would get this empire card, and it's also going to go into my tableau. And whenever you gain an empire card, you can see that there's this little pawn on the card. That's called a change of regime. So in this case, what that means is uh, in this game, pawns, these represent a few things. Sometimes they'll be on cards like this, and that means that they're, they're repressed serfs. But in this case, because I got a change of regime, I get to go up to the map, and I get to actually place my pawn on a border between cards. Because in this case, that represents a trade concession. So one of the uh, theses of this game is that because of the because of these bankers and the advent of capital in Europe, it is creating a new merchant class. And so here is one of the few pieces in the game that I actually own, which is um, it's my trade concession. So I would put it right there. Um, so in this case, I so remember my first action was to buy a card. My second action was to play that card and launch its jihad. So. That was two actions, and that would be the end of my turn. And then we would come up here, refill this market, and that's it. That's the end of my turn. Now, there's, there are a few other actions that you'll need to know before we begin the game. The first, the first is that, well, how do we get money? Uh, I've just spent half my money on launching the crusade of the handsome. So I, I'm going to need more money very soon. Well, I've already taught you one way, which is to buy cards with... Uh, with florins already on them, but there are other ways to do that as well. One of the ways is I can sell any of the cards that I have, um, whether it's in my hand or somewhere else. And when I do that, I am going to get two florins. Well, that's not very much, is it? I spent two florins, and if I sold this card, I would get two florins back. Well, the, un the main way to make money in this game is if you look over here, in the card area, there are two, you can see the West card and the East card. These are the trade fairs. And when we launch a trade fair, we're going to find where it starts. So in this case, let's say, uh, let's say that on his turn, Fred wants to launch a Eastern trade fair. 
the way that would work is this florin uh we would add another i think is it one florin uh, two, two two when when we we're three and four players we would add okay two yeah so we would add two florins to that stack so there would be three and we would actually come up here and you can see that the trade route is going to begin way up here in tana and and the way we know that is because we would follow this black line and we are going to start making money. And actually, this would be a terrible idea, Fred, for you to, as I'm sure you know, to do a trade fair. But if you did, we're going to uh, see what happens with this money in each space. So here it would start in Byzantium. And because I launched the trade fair, I get an option of what to put in there. And this is where those little spaces, you can see they, they come pre-printed with um, basically what the ruling class will naturally be. So perhaps if uh, it began in Byzantium, I would say, well, I want it to be a uh, reformist. I want it to be a reformist rook in Trebizond. And then it would move to the next place on the map. And in this case, it passes one of my pawns. Well, that means, oh, I just got a florin. The person that launches the, the trade gets a florin straight away. So That's true. Yes. So I would. I, so you would have gotten a florin for launching it. I would get a florin now. It comes into Hungary. There's no. There are no agents that we can add there. So it moves into Constantinople. Um, again, whoever chose to launch the trade route, they get to choose which of these agents go in, and then we just keep following it. And in this case, um, I would get a second florin because it hits my. Uh, my other trade concession, and then it would be over because there's no more money in that trade fair. So it would never enter Mamluk and cause an agent to appear there. And then we would throw away this card. Um, so cards are always churning through this uh, deck as we take these trade fairs. I hope, I hope very much, Fred, that you choose to do a trade fair, but I'm not going to assume that you would take uh, such a beneficial to you action. But maybe, um, maybe I, th I think that's depending on what Joe does, uh, we, we'll see. Because when we start playing the actual game, I think he's the one who will be the, the first player. Because yes, he will be the first yeah, player. That's true. Yeah. Figure starts, yeah. Now, the last couple of actions, um, the first one is you can activate your tableau. So you can see your cards, um, they have their position, like I showed you earlier, and they have their one shot and the agents they add. But here on the left of these cards, or the right if they're in the western part of your tableau, they have these icons. So you can take one of your actions to activate, for instance, let's say I activate the eastern part of my tableau. And then I can go through and every single card in my tableau can take one op. Ops are those little actions printed on there. So maybe I come uh, and, and the handsome, perhaps I want to do a siege in his area. Or perhaps I want to la launch a campaign out of Hungary, which would let me temporarily own all of the knights in Hungary for a single action. So Tableau Ops, the more cards you have, the more you've influenced, the more powerful those actions will become. Now, the very last action, though, this is the important one. This is the victory action. Because, of course, every game, usually when I explain this game, people sit down, we start playing, and then they go, well, how do we win? And that's a great question that I, uh, it's so hard to explain that I usually skip it at first. But let me tell you how you win. So shuffled into these market decks. So you can see there's our Western deck and our Eastern deck. Shuffled somewhere into both of these decks, there we have a Comet. We have two Comets in each deck. These comets are going to appear and they will go through the market just like any other card. And you can purchase it just like any other card. And when you purchase it, instead of going into your hand, instead you just throw it away and you get to come up here and we have these four victory tiles. You get to choose one of those victory tiles to flip face up. That victory tile, now anybody can use it to win. And it takes one action to win um, as long as you're meeting the proper conditions. And those conditions can be very different. There's also a fifth way to win, which is if both of these decks completely run out. Um, and then it's, it's sort of a tiebreaker victory. And I've actually never seen that happen, I don't think. Do you want me to go through how to win, or is that something that we should also we can, cover? We can have a quick overview without going into too much detail about what does each victory mean and what we're aiming for, roughly. 
Okay, so let me let me show you about these victory conditions. Uh, they're going to cover very different aspects of maybe forces that shaped the Renaissance. So we'll start here with this one that I already flipped over because it's kind of the easy one. Mm. So this one is Imperial Victory. You might remember that when I launched my jihad, I took over, I took possession of the Kingdom of Hungary. So down here in my tableau, I have this special card, the King of Hungary. And this card is a king card. So if I want to go after an imperial victory, all I, all I have to do is hold two or more king cards than every opponent. And this tends to be uh, the most straightforward victory condition. It also tends to be one that's very swingy because throughout the game, as you can tell, many things let you... Uh, have that change of regime. So just because I have this card in my tableau does not make it safe. Uh, it's very possible that someone will come and steal it from me. But nonetheless, for beginners, the Imperial Victory is usually the one that makes the most sense. So they'll kind of go after that one. Next, if we go up here, this is the Renaissance Victory. And um, what this one is, is first of all, let's say I come down here and let's say I conquer this king again. And yes, in this game, I can conquer this king, even though I own it already. Um, now, what? Now there is one big exception, and that's uh, the campaign action can never do this to your own people, because a king is not going to do this little thing, which is when I conquer this again, it flips over, and now instead of a king, it is a republic. And so this will no longer count as a king. It counts as a republic for this new victory condition which is the Renaissance victory. To win a Renaissance victory, you just have to have more republics than anyone else. But you also have to have, you'll notice that many cards have these little icons on them, these little diamond icons. And in this case, I do have one right here. And um, it is Liberty or whatever it is. Or I don't remember what it's called. But I have to have two or more of those than every opponent. So not only do I have to have more republics, I also have to have amassed some of those icons. And I can find those on many republics, but also I can find those on a number of cards. Like over here, we have, uh, yeah, you're right, there's one as well. Um, so we have the Catalan pa uh, Pactists down here. We have uh, some Rouge. And in both cases, those are going to give us those icons as well. The third way to win, that's up here. This is uh, this way is basically winning through a whole bunch of trade. Now, I've already shown you concessions. Those are the pawns that are out on the map. In order to win this, you have to have two or more concessions than every other player. But you also have to have more of, again, this little uh, prestige icon, the galley. And you can see that, for instance, this India Armada, that has the little galley on it. So you have to have... Uh, more of those than every opponent. And th this victory is that you create the most powerful trade empire. Now, the very last one. Well, okay, the second to last one, the one that's not a tiebreaker. This is the, uh, we flip this over. This is the holy victory. This is how you win with religion. And this one is the most complicated because it goes in two steps. The first step is that we have to figure out which religion is most dominant. And that's going to have uh, itself two steps. So you remember over here, I turned Hungary into uh, a theocracy for Islam. And we're going to see which religion is dominant. And the way we count that is first, uh, you can see Islam now has three pieces because it has two, two of these Islamic knights in Hungary. And then down here in uh, the Mamluk Empire, it has one landed uh, nobility. Now you contrast that with all other theocracies at the table. So over here in the papal states, Catholicism has one unit. So in that respect, Islam is currently the dominant religion. Well, there's one more thing they have to do, and that's to have the most bishops, more bishops than their opponents. Well, over here, bishops are a little different than other uh, uh, agents. They will appear on cards and they can move between cards to cause all sorts of trouble. If, if I had a bishop out, then Islam would be dominant. But that alone does not mean that I win. I also have to be the most influential banker within Islam. And that's accomplished by 
as you can see here on the handsome, I have another one of those little prestige symbols. This one is for Islam. There's one for Catholicism and there's one for over here. You can see that there's one for the reformists. And um, so I would have to, first of all, get Islam to be dominant and then be the most influential banker in Islam. And that's how you get the holy victory. Now, what if none of those happen? Oh, Fred, that's a great question. <laughs> I was about to ask you. Um, if, if that happens, then um, whichever of us was the best patron of the arts is going to win. Um, and in that case, you are looking, let's see, can we find one? Uh, uh, here, think... Oh, here's one. So the Mamluk Empire. Oh, Often yeah, perfect. You can, so there you can see, uh, you can see this little Michelangelo. Um, on the and, papal states too, yeah. Yeah, and on, on the papal states. And these um, often will go away when you turn these into republics. So you want to be careful. That is patronage. So that's you patronizing the arts and so forth. So if the game, if we run out of these decks, whoever has the most of those patronage I icons will win. And that is how you play Pax Renaissance. That's the thousand yard version. That's what perfect. Did I, did I miss a whole bunch of stuff? I think that's uh, that's maybe enough to get us started. Yeah, I think you covered all of the basics. Then the, it, where, what's going to be interesting is the the spice of it, which is going to be the different one shots that that are going to be there mm -hmm. and the different actions. But I think we can explain them as we go. What yeah. we're what we can cover those. Okay. okay. Yeah. But I think that's great. Thanks, Dan. And uh, we have this handy player aid with a summary as well. Yep. Yes, and I have oh, one good, in yeah. front of me just in case. Yeah. Excellent. The hardest part, the hardest part of the game is looking at the 10 cards in the market at the start. Yeah, I want it to be either Fugger or Jacques. I'm a bit sad, I'm a bit sad. I really like Fugger. <laughs> he was, uh, there is a small note on his board, on the, on the physical game about him being the richest man who ever lived, which I'm not sure that's true. Wasn't he the, the king of Mali? Like, uh, mm -hmm. that was the, the richest man who ever lived? I'm I'm curious how know. one assesses that. Yeah, I'm not sure. I know that the king of Mali was so exactly. rich that when he did the hatch, he actually created an economical collapse because he distributed too much gold on the way. So I think that's probably that's probably rich uh, if you make a, a whole continent economy collapse mm -hmm. by by giving right, too much. Right, right. And, well, and I think pretty sure that Jacob kept his money for himself. Uh, it's different, different kind of mindset. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't think Herr Fugger ever get ever had a flat screen TV. So yeah, exactly. How, yeah. how rich could he be? Yeah, that's fair enough. Exactly. So let's look at the cards. He'd be, he'd be can... overwhelmed if he came into my flat right now into my apartment. Yeah, he'd be like, whoa. Oh, like, I, I think no what, what would him. overwhelm him more than the TV would be the amount of spice that you have in your house. You'd be like, that's insane. You have <laughs> so do, much yeah. spice. <laughs> this is like uh, to, to, to their level of And standard. how I just tip that... salt in the, in the drain, you know, down the yes, bed. Like, yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> that would drive them nuts. So what's on the, what's, what's on the market right now? So okay. on the east one, we've got the Ottoman Navy. That's annoying because you can uh, kill pawns because you can just go across those cards and be mean. And then you've got a few stuff. Oh, there is something that we didn't discuss is that usually cards have the symbol of the place that they are in, but some cards, they are working in the whole, uh, in their whole elf. Mm -hmm. So this one, for example, uh, the, the Timar system uh, covers all of the East. So that's going to yeah. be a different symbol on the top left. Good. So it's a pretty lot of conspiracy. I'm it's, happy uh, to yeah. jump in and take my first one if uh, if you're ready. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Yep. No jihad. So I um no 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 jihad. I'm just going to buy this card here, the common common arrows guilds. So I'll buy that to my hand, uh, and I think I'll actually just play it straight away. So I play that to second action then as a play, which goes to the left here. Oops. Um, and then we look at the bottom for these impacts, right? So the first one is to place a concession. And I have a question here. Can Does it need to go in this empty spot between Portugal and Aragon? Or can I somehow displace this green pawn here? It's a green march only pawn. I think you, I think you can displace it, um, but it costs a coin. Yeah, you need to pay a coin to the, to the, to the player that you displace it from. And it will become that repressed. That was my memory as well. So it will go here. But so just yeah, to be clear for the people watching the stream, yep. yeah, 
uh, is that you could yep. trigger a peasant revolt with that bottom action, but you decide yep. not to. You are just using the the option on the left. Do I not go? Can I do them in either order, or do I need to do the one shot first? If you do the one shot, then that becomes an agent of that one shot. So I see. Yeah. I see. Okay. Good. Um, and, the okay. So let's the... think about this. If I did the one shot, then um, I would be. Yeah. So if you did uh, to mm. to to, you're gonna always think when you have one shots, especially for invasions like this. Think about attackers and defenders. And in the case of a peasant revolt, mm -hmm. the attackers would be all the um, so the agent that is on the card. So that would be one pawn. Uh, then you'll have the pawns that of your faction that are bordering that card, but at, at this yep. stage you don't have any. Uh, yes. Then there would be the repressed pawns, so the pawns that would have been repressed in previous turn that would be here. Uh, so the the people that would want to revolt because they've been uh, uh, screwed over by the previous regime. I see. And yep. th and then pirates. But at this stage, uh, you, there is none of those. So if you do that, you will be one on one. So you just yes. lose a pawn to kill a knight. Yep. And I'm not sure it's worth it. It's probably better to either place yourself here. Yep. So I uh, won't do that. And if I did do that, it would flip this to a republic. Yep. Uh, no, it yep. will just come into your board. You would have to do something else to make it flip regime, either by oh, a vote. that would be a strawman. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or or do a strawman. So another kind of action yep. that is not a campaign to actually flip it. That's fine then. I won't. I won't do the one shot. I'll just play one Florin to uh, Fred, I believe, to Mancini. Yeah. And but maybe one thing to consider. Put my in there. Is that this is pretty far on the trade route, so actually not repressing me and placing yours here might be a better shot. It's free, and you're gonna get more money from it. Because the trade route comes from here up to here, so being here is actually better than being here. Mm. Uh no, it's okay. I don't. I okay. want to get you off her. That's that's the that's the, the thing with Joe is that you have two options, one that is bad but mean to me, and one that is good. <laughs> so always take this one. Good, 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 Joe. Yep. But remember, so that was your direction. And you that's card, the end of my turn. I'm done. Play the cards, so now you can refresh yep. the market. I'm th I'm thinking I might. Uh be boring i i tend to play this way where i just purchase cards uh to begin oh and maybe we should ex specify that the hand limit is two yep two cards in your hand that's yeah. very good unless you have a i think there is one card that lets you um, increase it to four something like this i'm actually going to purchase two cards Oof. and then i'm done mm -hmm. Okay, but that makes the Ottoman navy available for money. That would let me repress, but there is no one to repress in the Ottoman Empire yet. And I also have a lot of money, so maybe I have a lot of options here. And there is the option of a holy war in England, which I don't think that England is ripe mm. for, uh, <laughs> for, so, for, for a holy war. <laughs> so, um, Joe, when you uh, repressed... Fred's piece. Yes. Where, where did that coin go? Oh, here. Uh, it should go to China. I gave it to Fred. Oh, okay, good. Sorry, Fred. No, no coins for you. Sad. Good. But the pawn was meant to go on Portugal, right? So that's now a yeah, yeah. It's still here. An yeah. underclass in Portugal, right? For revolt. Yeah. yeah, great. Yeah. Yeah, but there is no, um, there is no peasant revolt anywhere. Now I don't really know what to do, Joe. I don't know what to do. Um, hmm. Just get your get your pirates, get your Ottoman navy. Yeah, I think I'm gonna get the Ottoman navy. That's gonna be for me, and that's gonna be a coin for Fredo. And then, should I go all in on pirates? Maybe I should be just the the the, the king of pirates. Mm -hmm. And I have a few options <laughs> here to do that. And I like the idea of being the king of pirates. Um, but. Uh, that's usually I, how I play this game. I just I I play purely by theme. I'll be uh, and I'm thinking actually yeah. The... I'm I'm tempted, but I know it's stupid. <laughs> just like the idea of being the king <laughs> of pirates. No, that's stupid. I must focus, focus, Fred. Uh, and I'm gonna get uh, uh, those people here and exactly what I was trying to distract you from. So that's my two actions.
I'm going to begin my turn by doing a um, West Trade Fair. So let's go through this slowly. So I begin, actually, I'll just look at the player right here. I begin by putting two Florins on the West yep. Trade Fair spot. Then you we take... come along from Trebizond. No, 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 wait. Yep. You take one. Oh, for I, I always take yeah. one. Yep, I always yes. take one. Great. Then we come along from Trebizond and I put some pieces down. Um, I think I just want rooks so they don't mess with anyone too much. It's good. But here, then, I need to put a knight. Yeah, you don't have a choice. There's no other room. Um, yep. Here, I'll put a rook. And no, no coins are being spent for this, right? It's just... Um, nope. Yeah. Just happening. Yep. Um, then we come along. There's no room in the Papal States. Then um, yellow takes a coin. Yep. So one yeah, coin. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And then, then I have to add a green rook in Algiers. This is a very productive trade fair. Then I have to add it's... another green rook in Granada. Yeah, the trade is and then spreading. I take... The money is trickling. Yep. I take the coin and then I add a knight in Bordeaux. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Dan. And then a rook in yeah. Rouge. Uh, in then Rouge. I grab yeah. another coin, and then we continue. Does it stop? No, it doesn't stop yet. Then no, we it... add one more thing here, and I'll add a rook in Lubeck. The rook Perfect. in Lubeck, okay. Strengthening Perfect. Christendom. And then it just stops, and the other coins stay here. Yep. 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 Uh, Very nice trade. So that was your first action, we... so you did the West yep. Trade and Fair? Yeah, and then we discard the yep. yep. And then refresh the market. Or not? Uh, yes. Uh, no, uh, yeah, you will refresh it right, right now, right after the trade fair, I think. Yeah, okay, good. Cool. So I guess. And this card will uh, now disappear. Yep, it will get flipped over into it. So press it. Oops, maybe I press it again by accident. Good, okay. Done. Okay, great. Um, then I can see what there is. Then I'll just take a commerce. So I'll do um, the, what's the action called? Tableau ops for my and Tableau and do the commerce action on my one card. If I had other cards, I could do one action on each of them. Is that correct? Yeah, Otherwise, exactly. One one tableau. operation per, per card of the table, of that side yep, of the tableau. I had any more. Yep. So then I just take one card from the Western market. So I take one flower in yep. there. Good. And That's the end of my any card from any in the card. market. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Great. Then I'm done. Good. And uh, just for future reference, it does not refresh until the end of the turn. Uh, even okay. when you do the, the trade fair? Yeah. Okay. I see. Yep. Yep. So I cannot take any cards right now. I would have to sell something first. But I think, actually, I'm going to... Um, why don't we do this? So I'm going to play the uh, my favorite card in the game, the Papal Elephant. And he's so awesome that he creates an apostasy <laughs> crisis, which is uh, quite Excellent. something, an elephant uh, pr provoking a, a schism. That's uh, not every day. Yeah, so so for those who don't know what that is, if you have cards that are both uh, papal and uh, reformist, you're going to lose them all. Mm -hmm. But I wow. nobody has that many cards, so it doesn't matter yet. And then I'm, I will also play uh, my mining engineer. Whew. Um, which oh, no. doesn't do anything on its own. But now, uh, even though that was two actions, I can now activate my Western Ops without using an action. So I think I will. Um, so why don't we tax? And I can tax anywhere in the West. Why don't we tax? Joe, you have this uh, pawn yes. right here. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and so now you have a choice. You ha can either pay a florin... Oh, I can't do it there. Oh, sorry. I have to do it up here. And the reason is, is it has to be next to, uh, it has to have an empty city nearby. Oh, so, yeah. uh, so Joe, you can either pay a florin or you repress, you repress your pawn. And how, because um, it's a West card, who chooses, to... he, he, yeah. who chooses in which uh, empire he's going to be repressed in? Is it going to be you then? I think it's actually think... him. Oh, Let me look. Interesting. Because that will change oh, where it's, the Because you're happens. targeting the concession. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, you're targeting the concession, but the concession is in between two cards. So yep. the question is if you get repressed, where do you go? And even if you don't get repressed, uh, mm -hmm. where you're going to levy? I think you levy in both cases anyway. Yeah. So, but you're going to pay, I guess. You're going to pay to China. I'll pay one foreign anyway. Yeah. So you're not um, repressed. 
And then the and question is where it's gonna, who decides where the levy happens. Yeah. So let's let's see if I can find that in the rules because. Oh yeah, it just, it says target place a levy, but it doesn't say if the target. Does say target decides... place, and the target is me, I guess. So that does. Yeah, I, I think you choose the levy. It will be a knight, but it will have either to be a reformist or a, a, a Catholic one. Place of reformist because Dan seems to be going in on the Catholics with this papal elephant situation. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> Bow to my elephant. All right, and that and that's my turn done as well. Pretty spooky stuff. Well, well, my hand is full. Uh, I don't have a lot of money uh, anymore, so I think I'm going to play uh, this card on the west, and it has um, uh, a one shot action that would make me shift uh, the trade, but I cannot do it because it has a requirement of me having one of those symbols already in my tableau, which wasn't the case when I played it. So I cannot shift the, the trade. But if I did shift the trade, yep. what I would do is I will uh, take this disc, place it in the old one, mm -hmm. uh, and open the new one. And that will change um, the way uh, things are. But in that case, I cannot do it. So what I would do is still place uh, it. A concession here, just in between uh, Portugal and Aragon. That's going to be my first action. And then I can either buy a card or start playing Pirate. Mm, pretty tempting. And actually, I'm going to buy... I'm going to go in on the Pirates. <laughs> okay. So that was my two actions. Good. That's freed up for card I wanted to buy, which is perfect. Yeah. Just a quick so note, Dan. You, you, Dan, you now have forty minutes to beat us. So, Oof. yeah, no pressure. But we'll, uh... we'll continue to play recklessly. I'm gonna, seeing that Fred's going in on pirates, I'm gonna go in on ships, which seems like a worthwhile investment. Um, so I'm gonna get this Amerigo Vespucci um, in my hand. This guy. Mm. And will I just play it? Maybe I will. I'm in the same problem as Fred here. I could do a trade shift, but it won't, wouldn't be helpful. So I'll play this from my hand here. And that, again, I can't do a trade shift, so I'll just add a concession. Where are my concessions? And this is Aragon. Oh, I can't do this, because I would need to suppress somebody. So I won't do that. Uh, wait a minute. I'll keep it in my hand, and I'll just use my... You can yeah, place you... it here. Um, it's not going to be useful for trade, but it might be useful for peasant revolt or votes. I could. I could be very useful for trade. Yes. Yeah. It is useful for that, but I want... Because hmm. we haven't talked about it's votes true. yet, but uh, yeah, when, when you're doing votes, you want to have the majority of concessions bordering yep. the... Yep. Bordering the, the country I'll, I'll keep it in my hand for now. Um, yeah. yeah, I'll keep it in my hand for now, and I'll actually just do a trade fair again, because uh, I'm a kind person. So, another so Western trade China. fair. So, one there and one oh, comes straight to me. Yeah, yeah. No, no, it's just that uh, you had a weird lag and it looked like you, you, you were okay, dropping sorry. it on another yep. card. Yep. And then we just go through again. So I'll just go through and put these down. Uh, um, oops. Dan, get a coin next once I've got that there. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, Dan can then take one coin. One coin for Dan. I will get gonna be... two coins. So, yeah, that was mine actually. Oh yeah, one for you, Fred. I just give you. Yeah. yeah, I just give you. I'll get two coins, and I have to add a knight in uh, yep. France. Okay. There we go. Oops. Yeah, drop it. I will. Then I will that gets right discarded. Here. Thank you. Um, and then that's the end of my turn anyway, so we can refresh the market yep. as well. So I'll press that. Okay, done. Hmm. Not good. Okay. Well, I uh, I will purchase. No, Dan, the only. Oh. <laughs> That's your question, Joe. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say that the only easy way to remove cards from people's tableau is with a behead action, I believe. Is that right? Yes. So, yes. I love that action. Yeah, but you need to share the location. But I love yes. beheading. It's really, it's really yeah, fun. Good. Very good. Let's see. Uh, I think I think I will play it. Um, okay, so I also cannot do a trade shift, um, <laughs> yep. but I am adding a concession out of Portugal, and I, let's see, which of you uh, should I remove? I, I feel like, Joe, I should remove you. You should probably, yeah. 
so I'll pay my Florin to China for that. So that was two actions. But as before, I can activate this entire tableau for free. So I'm this card. Oh, it's horrible. <laughs> it, it's the best card in the game. As as everybody knows from the history of the Renaissance, nothing is more powerful than mining engineer. Mm. <laughs> Makes total sense. Um, yeah, so what I'm yeah. So what I'm going to do. So this commerce down here. Um, I am going to. I get to take a coin from the market. I'm going to just take it from the bank. Hmm. Uh, at that point, the Western Bank. And then I will use Inquisitor. So let's send this bishop. What Inquisitor is? So when an Inquisitor, um, so when a bishop is on a card, that card is silenced. It can't use its actions except Inquisitor. I'm going to send it over here. Come on. So it's going to be visiting you so that you cannot, this, this bishop is talking about God and heaven, and uh, you are so busy talking about God and heaven that you cannot do commerce. And that, that's my action. I'm finished. Well, if this is how you're going to play it, I'm going to get married then, and we'll see what you're going to do about that. Uh, gonna, I'm going to pay for someone's wedding. Yes, I'm going to, I really like this girl, Anne of Brittany. Um, and it's, they say it's love. Yes. Oh, wait a minute. I have two cards in my hand. <laughs> so can is the my end limit always the, uh, always controlled, or is it at the end of at the end of my turn? I'm pretty sure it's a hard limit. So you need limit. to sell something. Ugh, ugh, but I don't want to sell my pirates. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> okay. So you know what? I will I will play a pirate first, and then I will buy an. I'm confused. I, I don't know I'm what so, I did. I'm so glad that you clarified that you're going to buy Anne instead of uh, that you're paying for yes. her wedding. Well, she will owe me. <laughs> in a way, in a way. Oh, my uh, goodness. Do I, go, do I go east or west with my parents? Um, Aragon, Aragon, Aragon. Yeah, I'm going to go uh, with Western parents first. So I'm going to play uh, the Genoese fleet. And that lets me take one of those. Uh, so how do I know which color of pirates? Oh, they're going to be uh, Catholic the, pirates. Yeah, it's the color of their sails. So these are yeah. Catholic pirates. And I'm going to go here. Well, that's very rude. Yes. You have uh, murdered my, my people. And you have pirates here now. Perfect. Uh, so when trade is happening, they will take a coin, but it will go to no one. Uh, so it will just disappear. So they do mm -hmm. that. That's my first action. And now I can I pay, pay for the... And I can pay for the marriage of Anne of Brittany. Yeah. That's what I'm going to do. So that's one, two actions, and I can refresh the market. Ah, perfect. And I think that the, the trade concession for for a bishop is, is fair. Well... Yeah. More pirates. More pirates. This is awesome. <laughs> And there are Catholic pirates, so I guess the, as Joe would say, the good kind of pirates. I'm more impressed by the by the physique of um, Andrea Doria. There, he's, it's it's a great look. Beach, Which one? Beach ready body on Andrea on Andrea Doria, your 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 pirate. Yeah, he's your amazing. Fleet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the ideal male form there. I'm not um, sure it's Andrea himself. Uh, I I think it's Poseidon, but yeah. Well, you know, maybe it's Andrea as Poseidon. Maybe who knows? Well, yeah, I don't know. I think yeah. if I was him, I would like to be yeah. painted as Poseidon. So, for a picture. Yeah, if I was a, a okay, Genoese um, pirate, yeah. Very predictably, I'm going to once again do a trade fair because I need some money, and it's the best way for me to get money. So here we go. So one to me, um, and there's not going to be many more pieces placed down because it's full. So yeah. one to the pirates. Uh, one to Fred. Um, yep. One to Dan, and then one to me. Everyone is happy. Everyone get even the pirates. What I'm doing is I keep giving you. All... That's that's the problem here. And I also cannot take money myself. Okay, good. Then my second action, I'm just going to buy a card. Like this. Spend all my money to buy this one. Oh no, Joe! You knew you knew I was going for. Yep. <laughs> for the, <laughs> for the, for the, we for the pirate win, the one that doesn't exist, which is the one in my head, which is the one with the most pirate cards win the game. Pirate. Oh, and we have the first. Yeah. Yep. Oh, did oh, you discard that, that card here? The comet. 
Yeah, at the end of the uh, trade fair, did you? Oh yeah, I, I was meant to. Did. Sorry, you're right. Yeah. I didn't. No. no, no. Oh wait a minute. I didn't. Yeah, there we go. Keep the... So I'll do it again. Oh, that's fine. We have. The... Yep. And me. Yeah, it's okay. You stay here. It's okay. So Dan, your turn. Well, I have fallen madly in love. Did Did everyone understand it? it with Joanna. Oh and... yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Joanna you. Joanna the Mad. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, I'm madly in applause, love. Please with uh, Joanna the Mad. And uh, because of our love, I think, I think we should get married right away. Okay. Oh, so, no. Oh, that's, that, that should be fine. Because I think we... Uh, yeah. Okay. No, so, you're not I, right so I have married her. Now, sh this is a coronation action. I'm going to uh, marry into the Holy Roman Empire. Now these so what happens is this goes on here. These cards are now linked, and they are considered mm -hmm. one card. Um, I'm going to get a trade concession there, and um, I'm going to pay. Joe, I'm so sorry, but but your your pawn is repressed. Yep, yep. I'm wondering okay. if it might be easier maybe to keep it uh, on the on the board for the. Oh, you want it up here? That's fine. Yeah, I would. Yeah. Oh, the, you mean the, the repressed pieces? Yeah. Yeah, the repressed ones. Yeah, because then when you're taking it, it's readable easy, more easily on the board, I yep. guess. And now I, uh, once again, for free, I'm going to activate my Western Tableau. So why don't we begin? We will begin here with a commerce action, and we'll take the coin from here hmm. uh, just because uh, we're afraid. And um, let's see. Let me look at your tableau, Fred. Do I want to stop your repression more than? No, I'll, I'll keep your commerce bottled up, so I won't. I won't use that card. And and um, I, have a, I have a question. So if you use the an Inquisitor action, so because it's a West card, you could move it on any cards in the West, right? If that is not, correct. It's not bound to the location that you're in right now. So, well, so for you, uh, when it was on my West card, yeah, I could I could send it anywhere. For you, your only option is to send it to a Portugal card, or to send it to a neighbor. Okay, but I need to have an Inquisitor action on my board on, of my own. Okay, which I that, don't. that yeah. is correct. Um, now, in in my case, if I use the Inquisitor, I would I I would be limited to. I could send it to somewhere in Portugal. Or uh, adjacent. Okay. okay. Yeah. It, it's pretty. It gets limited depending on where it is. And I th let me let me look here. I'm just like, saying that there is a card in Portugal right here. Just you know, in case you're looking for one. <laughs> oh yes, that's a that's a wonderful idea. But I feel bad that Joe keeps having to give us money uh, for trade routes. But he so, enjoys it. He yeah. keeps doing it. So yeah, I he does enjoy it. He he does seem to like to share. But I'll be done with my turn and keep my bishop bothering you. <laughs> About God. Oh, God. But I guess I'm going to marry them. So Anne de Bretagne is going to marry into... You know what? I like friends. Uh, and it's not a biased reason. It's just that the situation on the board is good. I think... I think France is strong. There is two knights over there. There is uh, some settled nobles. Pretty strong. Trade is good. Um, so I think I'm going to marry in France. So I'm going to do the coronation one shot, get the French card. Not on that side. I'm not marrying Republic. I'm marrying a king. And that's my first action. And you get a concession. Yes. And I'm going to be able to place a concession that I'm going to place here. Not repressing anyone. It's a happy marriage. Everyone is happy. So action one. Then action two. Hmm. So because the Corsairs are in Aragon, I can only, they could only go here. That's the only place where they could go. They couldn't go here because it's, yeah. It needs yes. to be matching the card uh, mm -hmm. of the action. Actually, launching a trade now could be a good thing. That would give me two coins. I would get any. Yeah, and you would get zero <laughs> coins. It sounds you, like. You should get three coins. Yeah, three coins. Yeah, you... That's true. One from the initiating the trade plus two coins, and I mean, but I mean, any coin plus Joe not getting any coin is always a mm -hmm. it's always a win. <laughs> and I think that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do the the west. Okay. You're, you're trying your hardest to two coins there. Yep. 
Yep, so that's one coin for me. Uh, then it goes across, boom, boom, boom. Uh, one coin for the pirates. Uh, and then uh, one coin for Fred, one coin for Dan, one coin for Fred, one coin for Dan. And... Look at this. Horrible. And that's it for me, and I will refresh the market. And that means that potentially the comet could disappear without having been used to trigger a victory condition, right? That is correct, yes. Yeah. So you could end up in a situation where only just a couple of victory conditions are activated because of that. Okay, I'm going to do commerce first, and I'll take this far in here. And then I'm going to play some French yep. pirates. Commerce sounds so petty. Yeah. No, do I want that? No, I do. No, I don't want that. Yeah. Uh, I've got very bad options now. Really put dug myself into a corner. Maybe I should buy a card instead. Dan, what happens when tokens are emancipated, as this uh, enclosures gives here? Would the, would the emancipated concessions get to get back on the board? I believe so, and you, you can pay to swap them. Uh, that's my understanding. So let me yep. look really quick. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's basically the same as a regime change. Whenever a regime change happens, you can emancipate anything you want. But I, I do yeah, think so it then is if there one, were spots. Yeah. It's like it's one florin for every um, everything you bring out, I believe. Because you may have to swap mm, something. Okay. Maybe I won't. What can I do instead? Um, I can play a card. That's a more sensible thing to do. Yep, I'll play these French pirates. Here we go. Uh, I'll, I'll put them. Oh, where is France? That's England. Yep, France there. I'll get rid of this concession here. Can we go there? Yeah, no, 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 no. Yes. You that got rid a, of me there originally. Seems that was a okay, flagrant done. foul. That's brutal, Drew. And uncalled for. But I like it. Mm -hmm. Well, I I don't. Yep. Let's see. Well, I I'm sad. I thought we were friends. Perhaps I was wrong. After all this insider trading. Yeah. Well, I'll buy the enclosures. And then um, I will play the enclosures. And I will pay a coin because we're going to be repressing. We're going to forego that revolution. We're going to repress our good friend Fred. Mm -hmm. Hi. Perfect. Uh, but then I will launch my Western Tableau. Uh, you, did you pay the coin for, for that awful repression? I, I did. I tossed it back in the bag. And, um, or wait, so I started with, uh, maybe I didn't here. I'll, I'll pay another coin. It's fine. Uh, because I'm going to now activate this tableau. So we're going to pick up both of these coins. Um, I like what you can, when you are, when you, when you're so powerful that you can pay extra cash just to flex. It's like, oh, if we have a doubt, I'm, I'll just pay more <laughs> money. You know what? I'm not, I'm not a, a florin is nothing. I, I, I gave it to the common man. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I'm, I'm very disappointed. Joe, just because I'm disappointed in you, this bishop is going to come visit you <laughs> and talk to your uh, guilds about God. And that will be, that will be my turn. Yeah. Let's say, hypothetically, I did a tiny campaign. Like, and I did a campaign in, in England. And let's say I won that campaign for example. Would I be able to free that pawn? Yes, you can emancipate that pawn. So you Great. can you can pay a florin to bring it out and send my pawn back to the empire. Okay. Good. Yeah. I would still need to win a campaign, which is unlikely. Then again, there are pirates mm -hmm. <laughs> teasing me, saying... I mean, currently, you could campaign against the papal states. And I win. could... Yeah, I could campaign against the papal sets and win. I could do that. Then I could launch a trade and get a piece back. Oh, no, it wouldn't go to there. Mm. Could I tax myself? I don't yes, have a tax. you can. You, yeah, you you I, I don't have a tax action. That's the problem. There is not enough money in the Western trade. Who did that? I don't know. I don't know what happened. Uh, I can have an unlimited hand size, but I don't think it's super useful. 
I'm worried about the papal state because if I campaign against it, I'm going to take it over. That's for sure. But it's going to be very weak. Then it's not that anyone can attack it anyway. So maybe it's not too bad. Pretty tough decisions. Uh, you know, it, it, whenever in doubt, you can always sell your cards. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I recommend selling this one and this one. Yeah, that's a, that sounds like a really good idea. That sounds great. No, I don't like that. I'm gonna. Um, I have. Um, I have. Yeah, I have. I can afford to have a second card. So I'm going to take pirates. When in doubt, take pirates. That's what I do. <laughs> so one, I'm gonna take pirates, and two, I'm gonna play pirates. For now, that's what I'm gonna do. So that's my uh, pirate action, and. Of course. I think I know where I'm going to put the pirates. They're going to go here. The and these ones are reformist pirates. Oh yeah, they're not the not the kind of pirates I like. Also, they can't go right here. They have to go in France. Yeah, they're from France. Oh, I thought yeah. I thought they were. Oh yeah, okay, my bad. So I know you like to believe that this is French territory, but it's not red. Yeah, uh, for me, the French territory is the the Holy Land. Like we shouldn't have reformists. That's bad. Uh, but yeah, okay, so that's British soil. But then that's it. So I bought a card, played a card, uh, killed some people. Sounds like a, a good a good turn. Back to you, Joe. I'm gonna make some. Can I make okay. some space? You're really there? messing up all my plans, Fred. You're really you're really messing things up. You're also going for the pirate victory. Um, I, uh, it's not the pirate victory, but yes, I was going for the pirate victory indeed. So I'm actually gonna buy the comet. Hmm. Um, so it just immediately gets discarded, and I choose yeah, a correct. condition. So I yes. will choose the uh, globalization victory condition. Yeah, but that's the, the reason I'm doing that is because I think condition. only me and Fred have a good shot at it. And yeah, it's going to be fine because yeah. we need to have two more, and then, and then two more concession with that many yes. parties than each other. Tricky. Yep. <laughs> but then, and I can't even repress the pirates, can I? So I will. Can you? I think you can only kill pirates with other pirates. Says, oh, the pirates can kill each other. Yeah. Yeah. So I could do that, which is not such a bad idea, because then that would clear me up some room. Uh, or I could just repress and remove one of your knights. I'll do that. Uh, I think that's what repress does. So I'm doing my tableau. Um, so. So uh, it depends what's the symbol. No, do you see the repress symbol here is a concession uh, that you have only on it. I just take some if, concession. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. If if there was another another so silhouette on it, someone else you, you, it back. Yeah, I'm gonna put it back. If there was another silhouette, you could, but in the, in that specific case, uh... Uh, in that case, I'll actually just play this card to my tableau, um, and I'll need to pay a florin to replace Fred's concession there. I believe and that he's probably just gonna pirate me and remove it. Oh, right. uh, no, no, this one is gonna be repressed too. Yeah, it's not going to kill. It's oh, not sorry. Not yeah, gonna press, yeah. Yep. Pressing it. Oh, you, uh, I could have put mine up here, but I need to get out to Trinket Money. The trade shift happens. Yeah, if you you're, want to. you're, you're shifting uh, trade yeah. if you want. Yeah. Uh, do I need to, or can I choose not to? You choose to. Okay, I think in this case it wouldn't benefit me, so I will not do it. Yeah, because the one that you just placed would be useless now. Okay. Done. Okay. And mark it. Very rude, all of these. Um, okay, it's pirates. Well, around. I, I'm gonna purchase a card, and I will play the card, and uh, we should probably, well, we will repress somebody who's even up here. Oh, I can't. It would be my own person. Yeah. Well, that, that okay. So I won't pay. He'll just be repressed. That's fine with me. Now, uh, I'm going to activate this to get three coins. Because uh, I don't think I'm going to be making much from trade routes anymore, unfortunately. So, uh, and this is a tricky spot. I, I think we're going to move this bishop back to Fred. Yes. Oh. He just keeps, uh, he's very busy. He's very devout. Okay, and that, that's it for me. I'm done. I think I'm going to get married again. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> I'm going to get a second husband. 
Yeah, I'm not happy with the first one, but I like the second one because it keeps me socially distant from anyone. Like if I if I go, so if I if I get Catherine of Navarre, it means that. Mm -hmm. oh. or, so it says Portugal and France are not adjacent for all players. Mm -hmm. What does so it means that just this border here. Yeah, this border have, no longer oh, yeah. exists. Yep. This border no longer exists. Yeah. That's useless if you already have friends, actually. I wouldn't see a massive benefit from that. Then there is a... I, could you I take, wait? You could take Aragon, maybe. Uh, I, I couldn't take Aragon. Oh, yeah. Well, if I, yeah, if I married in Aragon, yeah, I could do that. I think I maybe have... I might have, I might have put too many pirates on the board. Uh, <laughs> my hubris. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I don't know what to do. Maybe I should go in the east. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. But I already have mm -hmm. one in my hand, so I think it's. I think I'm probably gonna go in the east. I think things needs needs to happen in the east. And I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna. I, I need to have something to tenderize the meat. And I think that the Timar system is exactly doing that. So I'm gonna do one, two and get this card for one. So that's going to be my first action. And my second action is going to play the Timar system and makes me place a Muslim Rook anywhere. And there is only one spot free. So I'm going to place it here in Cyprus. That's my first action. And then that's your, first, that's your first two actions. Oh, no, no, that's just my two action because I bought a card and played the card. And that's pretty much it for me. So I'm going to refresh the market now. And then you have 10 minutes to win. Oh, oh. <laughs> I'm in trouble. I, you can do it. Confident in your skills. Just trying to work out what to do because there's too many pirates around. <laughs> Somebody. Somebody put too many pirates everywhere. So I think... So what do you have? Well, you, you have the power to remove That's some of those trick. pirates. Yeah, you could do something about it, Joe. You could pacify the seas. Yeah, with this card. Look, put one move yeah, on I will, the will do... That's true. I will do my tableau, and I can use that to get rid of one of these. You can get rid of those pirates. Uh, or I could tax in Aragon. Yeah. But I can't tax because there's no location to tax. Yeah, there is nothing to... Yeah. yeah, all bad options here. I think I need to... I think I'm going to need to do a trade fair. It wouldn't even get me any money, though. Well, it would get me one. And I can't buy any cards. I might even need to sell cards, you know. Dan did say that was a good option. So I'm going to sell this for two points. Don't you want to do its action before? No, I don't. So I'll just okay. open up a slot for someone else to put things in. Uh, I'll sell that, and then uh, I guess slides along. Then I will buy something. That lets me behead people, but not the right people. Um, I'll actually just sell this Aragorn card as well, because I need the money. We're selling all our trade connections. Okay, I'm done. Just selling cards. Very sad turn. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. <laughs> uh, you sound like you have an idea, and I don't really like that. I, I do have an idea. Well, first we're going to buy the Comet. It doesn't sound good. Ugh, I can't. I kind of don't. I don't want to win the that way though. Oh, that would be so. You know, I, I know. Like you're supposed to, to come here, teach the game, <laughs> and you're going to have that imperial. Oh god! I'm so embarrassed. I. Oh. I'll buy a second card. Yeah. And then uh, for free, oh. I'm activating my tableau. Get our money back, most of it. I'm I'm so sorry. I'm so mm -hmm. sorry. I'm embarrassed. I know you invite me on, and I I just I ruin it. Yeah, so disappointing. And and that's my turn. I'll be done. I do something about you going for that. You're gonna marry. You're gonna have two. That's not enough. You need one. It more. is. It is not enough. So you don't need to worry. Yet. About me. Uh, there are conspiracies here and there. Conspiracy in France wouldn't do a lot of good. 
And yet... I know what Dan's going to do. The Borgia Conspiracy. Yeah, that's the, th the one that I'm a bit worried about because this one it opens up in all of the West. Now, isn't that the plot of Assassin's Creed or something? The Borgia Conspiracy? Sounds about right. Yeah. And if, when you were doing that conspiracy, would it include the bishop as well as one of the attacking pieces? No, it would not. Okay. Yeah, the, the, oh, wait, the, con the conspiracy would be the agents, uh, so the Reapers, oh, Hooks, and Knights, yeah. uh, bordering See. pirates. And the problem is that there are oh, bordering pirates. pirates. <laughs> 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 so they, this, that might be a problem. Who put those pirates so there? It would only be... It would only be yeah. There would be two pirates. Um, yeah. But if I yeah, do, so it wouldn't it wouldn't conquer France. Could I win a conspiracy in the West with that? No, almost against papal states, but not really. You'd need another repressed piece. I think I'm still gonna buy it. One, very good. Two, and get it. So that's one action. And then I'm thinking that with uh, with that second action, I'm gonna activate uh, my tableau here. And the first thing that I'm going to do is do some uh, Corsairs in Aragon. And then it's going to go here. Horrible. Um, then I'm going to activate... Just destroy my only possibility. Other Corsair here. And they are going to kill those guys. So a bit less pirates around France. So that limits the option of... Um, mm -hmm. For conspiracy, I guess I could siege in France, but I definitely don't want to do that because that would be weird. Why would I siege in my own? Yeah, because uh, I can only siege here. Just uh, yeah, correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but if there were some red pieces, yeah, yeah. that could be an option. Right. I could siege, remove it, and then run the trade and and get some money. Mm -hmm. I cannot commerce because someone is being a bully. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I could I could campaign. Do I want to campaign straight away? I don't want to campaign yet. So that's going to be my uh, my two actions. I bought a card and run my tableau. To refresh the market. Okay. Then you have yes. three minutes to win. Oof. Excellent. Oof. I mean, oh, and I'm, maybe something that happened in I'm the run TTS. My can okay, do commerce. Just one one thing that I'm going to explain that happens in the TTS module. Mm. That you you just for yep. people that might play it physically at home. The, the the draw pile for the west was empty, so we started drawing from the eastern market into the into okay. the west. So now it's going to refresh from here. And is it yeah. as soon as there is no more cards the decks here? Quicker as well. Yes. Or is it or is it when when the, the the markets are empty? I'm pretty sure that the game ends when both uh, decks are empty. empty. Okay. But I can look that mm -hmm. up. Uh, and now I'm thinking I don't have any of those uh, <laughs> points to. Yeah. So I just, um, I just bought this card here. Yeah, I was keeping an eye on those as well, but I haven't seen many. Um, no, I haven't seen yeah. many either. And it's something interesting that Dan mentioned earlier, actually, which is the, the character of the game depends a lot on which cards even turn up. Is it my turn? Yep. Yeah, oh, sorry. Okay. I bought one card at the end of the market. I see. Okay. Um. Okay. Let me look at this um, just to make sure I'm not being silly. Is it going to be the winning turn? I'm going to play. Okay, so we're, we're getting married uh, in Aragon. Mm -hmm. with, a good com with a successful campaign, that could be a win. And it's, it's a beautiful yeah. ceremony. So that was one action. I'm going to activate this for oh. free. You, see, you, you need to pay for that repressed token. Yep. It was already there. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. yeah. uh, I just moved it from the card. Oh, yes, I uh, killed someone. I forgot. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I made the space empty for you. Um, okay, so I'll activate this for free. And we are going to, the first thing we'll do is we're just going to raise some money. Oh, that's going to be bad. That, that sounds like, that smells like a campaign. When... <laughs> and then um, we're actually going to do two campaigns. So yeah. we'll start with yep. this campaign out of uh, Aragon. And so I have to pay two because of because of my knight. And then, oh, I'm so sad that this campaign was a failure. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll launch a second campaign out of uh, the Holy Roman Empire. It will cost me two, and we have conquered it. Yep. And then for my final action, I will claim victory. So 
Very so nice. why did you? My question is why did you right pay, on bang on schedule? As well. Why did you pay two? Because did you don't you pay one per attacker and there is only one attacker in each of the campaigns? Is it one per? I thought it might. Yeah, have I think it's two. one florin per. That's yeah, I, I can see oh, it. One. Yeah. Okay, so you're right. I have two florins left over. You're right. So I win by more. Nice. So just to explain, so when we're doing a campaign from the the, so you can take the knights in that space. You pay one per knight that you're sending over. So the first one, you took the knights from Valencia to kill the knight from Venice. And uh, yeah, and the second one uh, you did from HRE to invade here. And it was a success because there was no defender. You don't yeah. need to move that uh, knight. You can just, uh, it's just a, a, an instant success and you take that, that piece. There is and, no actual uh, movement. And something kind of interesting happens where you can see it down here, where you they actually become this big shared card because it's uh, it's now the vassal of the card that conquered it. But that does mean that I have two more king cards than uh, each opponent. Yeah. So that was that was uh, that was the game. Magnificent. Just on time, and we lost Joe, so he might reconnect. Oh. Uh, in a minute, yeah, yeah. Oh, I I didn't mean to offend him. Yeah, he, Joe was so upset that he was like, <laughs> "Screw it, I'm I'm out." It was an, an epic win, an epic win, and it's nice that it was because we didn't do any campaigns during the the whole game, and you won by doing two campaigns in a row. But I think that that card, that uh, mining engineer, is extremely extremely powerful because it gives you the option of doing yes. all of this for free each turn, which is quite insane. Um, and that that ended. Up, ended up giving you the victory because you were saying that it was quite swingy those um imperial i think i feel that 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 specific kind of victory it's yeah you really benefit from from having that extra activation of the tableau but it was great well shall we debrief i guess yes please yeah. maybe the first question that i would have uh for for you dan is i guess you've played most of the pax games right um, yeah, so I've played all of the published PAX games, and I've played. I there's a there's another PAX game coming out sometime soon, and I have played that as well. That one is not from Ion. It's a it's a it's a fan and a designer who was inspired by it, and he has designed his own PAX game, and I've played that. And I I uh, we'll see how it turns out, but I I think it's pretty good. So yeah, I, I have played all of the current PAX games. And how would you say that this one com compares? Uh, like, is it your favorite one? Yeah, that's hard. And, and it changes with the day. <laughs> um, I, you know, this is probably, um, I, I would say I, there's only one I don't like um, of the PAX games, and that's PAX Emancipation. I think that one is, is kind of weak. I think it, it makes the weakest historical argument. Its gameplay is a little too cluttered. It takes a lot of time to understand what it's asking you to do. So I don't like that one very much. Pax Renaissance is probably my my most consistently favorite one. But depending on the day, I would tell you Pax Perfuriana, Pax Pamir Second Edition, Pax Transhumanity. I, I, I like all of those. So Yeah. And but what I, I feel from having played quite a few Pax games that this one feels a bit different from, from the others uh, in the sense that there's the spectrum of actions that you can take are quite diverse, how they uh, differ from each other. They Most of them have the same outcome. If you think conspiracy, coronation, peasant revolt, campaign, all of them are just to take one card in your tableau, you could say, but all of them have small subtleties between who's going to be the attacker and the defender, all of them for thematic reason, but it's it's quite a lot. But then it builds a quite interesting theme. Do you think it's that that makes it different from the others, or there is even more the theme itself? And and what do, you, what do you think makes this one special? You know, personally, what I find makes this one so special is the Renaissance is not my field of history, but you can't study what my field of history is without talking about the Renaissance. And and there's always this question, you know, what what is happening in the Renaissance? How do you how do you bound the Renaissance and who are its principal actors? Like what is occurring in the Renaissance? Uh, because it's this massive uh, period of transition and change for Europe and by extension for the whole world. Um, and whether that's a positive change or not very much depends on where you are, uh, what class you are, who's benefiting. But more than most games, I, I love that this game is just so cosmopolitan. 
you know, it, it, it brings in a whole bunch of different elements, you know, just in the game that we played, you know, this emphasis on uh, people who are outside of regular structures of power, mercenary pirates uh, had so much impact on the game. And in the game's early moments, it seemed like it might be about religion. And at other times, it seemed like it might be about the democratization of the peasantry. And in the end, it was about the formation of some major empire. Um, I love that it touches on all of these things. You know, we look at uh, other games and they might be about one of those things, about warring empires or about uh, religious disputations. And what this does is it takes all of those very different ideas and it puts them into one game. And it does it with a pretty light set of rules. And, and that's, of course, comparative. But you compare it to something like Here I Stand, you know, which if you play Here I Stand, mm -hmm. you're going to need eight hours. I, and I have had great experiences, you know, getting a group of friends together and setting aside a whole day to play Here I Stand. And, and that can be very exciting. This game covers more than Here I Stand in an hour, which I think is a magnificent feat of design. Now, do, do all of its arguments bear out? Uh, no, but I think actually it gets a lot right, even including like, so, you know, one of the defining factors of the Renaissance is the invention of European capital and banking. Now, does that make it, uh, does that make it appealing to pay, play as bankers? No, not necessarily. Does that mean that the bankers really had the reach that the game portrays? No, but the game is trying to give you this cosmopolitan you know, perspective and let you touch all these corners of its history. And it's very difficult to frame that. Like, who can you be that lets you experience that breadth of history? Well, I, to me, you're basically a secret society. You know, it, it's basically magic. And, and plenty of games have to have that level of concession anyway, you know, even to the point where uh, well, there, there are games about, you know, driving history from the perspective of some sort of, you know, you're just like the ethic of a people, you know, who do you play in a civilization game? You have more command in most civilization games than any king or emperor mm. ever had. So I, I feel like that's a concession to the gameplay. But in the end, I just this sandbox, you know, in history, there's always these questions that we raise about why did something turn out the way it did instead of some other way? You know, why, why is this moment what launched Europe to uh, begin the age of colonizing everybody? And I think the game does show that there are multiple outcomes in history and it can, it can depend on which historical events get capitalized upon. And that can be, it can be chance. You know, I'm a big believer in historical chance that sometimes things just happen because they happened. And I'm a big believer in human agency. Uh, that sometimes there are people who are trying to make things occur and that that history is really this combination of human will and accident, uh, that it can be very chaotic. And more than most games about history, this game captures that. Uh, so that's what I like about it. Now, uh, are there places that I disagree with it? Yes, even vehemently. And uh, I understand that you have your own theory about what this game is portraying. And that's one reason I'm so excited to play it with you and hear uh, what both of you think of it. Because, uh, you know, I've chatted about this game with so many people, included, including some very talented people, whether they're designers or historians. And everyone seems to have their own perspective on what the game is actually saying. And, and maybe we have to ignore the footnotes to get there. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's always the thing that comes up. It's like, yeah, don't read the footnotes. They're, they're wild. And I think they don't, they don't necessarily portray what the game is portraying. Uh, but I think you, you raise a lot of interesting points. But before uh, reacting to that, I would like to, to, to go to you, Joe, because you also played quite a few uh, PAX games. And we I think all the games of PAX Renaissance that I played, I think all of them I played with you, with the exception of one game. So we discovered the game uh, together mm -hmm. after having played together Porfiriana, Pamir, uh, second edition. Mm -hmm. So I think most of my PAX game I played with you, but I... I I would be interested to, to see how you feel about this one compared to, to the other ones that we played before. Yeah, so from, from more of a gameplay perspective and less focused on, on what it's saying, although this might be connected, um, I, I found it quite striking that, um, you know, as, as Dan said earlier, you, you only see a very limited number of cards in each game. And, and then the cards you see, I think, really define the game. So, so this game ended up being really West-focused, like almost no East cards played. Lots of pirates, partly because of Fred 
playing lots of pirates, but you know, there, there was lots of pirates and lots of trade in it. And, and maybe me and Fred got a bit too focused on that and that let Dan kind of sneak through with more of the kind of empire strategy. <laughs> but, you know, in, in a previous game I played with Fred, it was it was pretty much only East cards played because there were lots of really nice looking East cards. And it was much more about the wars between uh, different faiths in the East and d- different empires clashing. And that, that felt like a very, very different flavor of game. And that, that's quite interesting. And I think uh, quite quite strikingly different to other, other PAX games. So, you know, PAX Premier... Um, you know, it's important to, to gauge whether the Russians or the British or whoever are going to be stronger in the opening market. But but really, you know, you, you can kind of take it where you want from that starting position. And in Pax Porfiriana as well, you need to read the market a little bit, but, but you, you know, there's lots of options. Whereas it feels like, like in this game, you really need to look at that opening market and figure out what, what, what the game plan is going to be. And some some of the victory options aren't even going to be possible um, if that doesn't come up more. And perhaps perhaps that points towards something more like history determined by chance rather than by individual actors. Um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly, but that, that, that seems like a, yeah, quite a striking feature of this game. And it, it relates to something which I, I think I, well, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm torn. Um, I'm always left feeling like I like this less than in some other PAX games, but it, it feels almost too constrained sometimes. So if the right cards come up, there's just some stuff you really can't do at all. There's not like, you know, a more costly option to do something, but there's just, you know, you just can't do that. You can't interact with this thing or that thing. But at the same time, that does that does create a very kind of unique puzzle every time you play, and that's that's interesting. And I've I've certainly found it an interesting experience every time I played. Yeah, I think it's to your point. I think it's really interesting how the games can go widely differently. I think that's 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 sure. I, I I like also the diversity of what what is portrayed in the game, and I think this choice of taking the banker's point of view actually makes that possible because the bankers will have potentially the opportunity. To interact with a, a wider range of, of actors um, within that scope, and to your point on what you were saying down about who are you really playing, I do believe that you're not really playing a, a bank, an individual banker at all. I think it's just for for pure flavor. The way I see it when I'm playing it, I feel like collectively we're playing the 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 the, the merchant ca- as a class. Like as a, and that's the thing that I like about the game is that I think that in a way, and I think. I don't think that um, that that Philip Klon is a Marxist, but when I play the game, I think it makes a really strong Marxist uh, per, uh, argument sure. that we're playing as a class, and what we're playing is actually the transition from feudalism mm-hmm. to capitalism, and this is exactly what we're playing. Like we are playing the class of the merchants. We are in a lot of ways the driving force, just because of wealth and what we're trying to achieve, which is concentration of wealth. And to concentration of wealth, we have an impact on a lot of different levels uh, of the uh, socioeconomic fabric in a part of the East, but mostly in the Western world. And we're having that impact out of pure greed. But as a class, we're driving that change without really considering the consequences of it because we're just gay, we're just looking for something. And it's, yeah. the consequence of it might be, oh, we built a big empire or we started capitalism right. or something like this. But we're playing as a class, which I think is really interesting um, uh, as, as a game. And I was thinking about this. I started rereading that that book, which is a so it's a it's a series of articles and discussion amongst uh, historians, most of them Marxist historians from the fifties and the sixties. So it's directed by so some of you who followed my work on Just of Robin Hood will recognize the name Rodney Hilton, and that's the whole discussion around like what are the reasons from for for the transition and. I think when you're looking at it from a Marxist perspective, there is a bit less luck involved. Uh, like it's oh, yeah. it, there is more of a natural uh, thinking that the modes of production are going to change, and the merchant class is going to be m- more uh, like it's going to open up commerce and, and change the way we produce goods and change the um, the hierarchy, the social hierarchy in the in the modes of production. That's that's kind of inevitable, which I think that the game doesn't say. So I'm not saying it's a pure Marxist game, but it does have some element of orthodox Marxism in the way of, of looking at materialistically at history. And I love the idea that you're interacting with a wide range of actors, which I think is a feature of the PAX series that I find really interesting, like thinking about how major events are impacting different parts of society. And I think it does that really in an interesting way. And yeah, I, I think it's, yeah, I think, I, I think it, and also think it's a, it's a quite beautiful yeah. game also, but yeah, go ahead, Joe. I was just thinking in terms of that, that kind of underlying message the the kind of marxist message of phil eckland um that it i mean it, i was just thinking about about the other pax games and the closest in that sense would maybe be something well maybe transhumanity but maybe also porfiriana insofar as you know you've got these basically rich uh mm. um, I send that 
yeah notable figures and and you know they're they're playing all sides against each other so they might incidentally sponsor a peasant uprising but that's really mm. just just kind of power play or something um so there's something maybe a little similar there in terms of what 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 kind of figure you are uh, whereas in Pamir it's very different because you're you're more like a kind of regional grouping you want to gain control of things but not necessarily for financial motives as such it's a, it's a slightly different kind of sense of what's going on there um yeah i, I guess i mean that... i guess that's kind of, kind of facile thing to say that underlying all these pax games is some some kind of grab for power by different different mechanisms so that's kind of obviously true perhaps yeah that's true that's definitely true they, they all have that that very unique perspective on, on the event i haven't played emancipation i i have it but i'm i've tried to go through the rule book so that's what what it looks like and i, I was <laughs> I was I was very I must say I, I've played all of the PAX games and so I thought I, I thought that going into this one that was gonna be easy and I was extremely confused. Uh, I would like yeah. to play it at some point, but I was uh, yeah baffled. Did you did you play Transhumanity? Yeah. Oh no, I haven't played Transhumanity. We, but... we could try that sometime. I it, it didn't grab me as much as some of the others at first, but I, I'd be happy to try it again sometime. But I think that thematically in my mind, I don't even consider Transhumanity as part of the series because because I, I think that I, I yeah and, and it's purely personal. I'm not saying that's yep. that, that's a fact and I don't have a strong argument for it. I just say that in my mind, the, the thing that I associate with the PAC series is you have a, a general historical event. You take sure. a very odd perspective uh, on it, and then you interact with um, a wide range of actors to 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 get a to get to get out on different kinds of victory condition. And then you come to me with Pax Transhumanity, and just the name, I'm like my my eye turns blank, like I'm like what the, what the hell is that about? And I'm and I'm instantly uninterested. And I think part of my mind doesn't even consider this game as existing. But I, I should probably try it at least for mechanical reason, just to 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 see what, what what it is. And it's probably great. It's just it's probably just not for me. That's the, it's yeah. it's mechanically quite different as well. I'd say to some of the others. I'm not sure uh, Dan Dan's probably played it more, but it's um. It's interesting. It has some some interesting kind of different things going on for sure. I I would agree. In in a way, it almost has more in common with something like Oath, yeah. because it, it's about a shared tableau. You know, you're not making your own tableau. You're making you're trying to manipulate your standing in a shared tableau. I I think that you know I one reason I really enjoy Pax Transhumanity is I feel like it tries to express how how the Pax formula is applied in a fictional setting just in that it, these are really idea maps right mm -hmm. that that these are they're they're throwing spaghetti against the wall <laughs> um, that's their approach to history and i like seeing that as a as a conceptualization so i i am not a future historian but there are many historians who get involved with what you know tr sort of predictive modeling you know what are mm -hmm. Instead of just looking at uh, material changes or inventions and seeing how how has that changed history, trying to preempt a little bit, how is this going to change history? I tend to think historians are terrible <laughs> at predicting the future. You know, I remember when the Arab Spring was happening and all the historians were going, oh, this is the moment. This is the moment that everything is going to change. And then it didn't. And um, just things like that. I think historians are notably terrible at telling uh, the future, but but I do think it highlights what I like so much about the Pax series. You know, going into a game like Pax Perfuriana and and cards on the table. Pax Perfuriana is the game that's hard hardest for me in terms of its message, in part because it's close to home. Um, so I live in a part of the United States that is we're not on the border, but we're close to the border. And specifically, um, for instance, there's a card in Pax Perfuriana. That is um, Mormon lumber. And so my ancestors came to where I live today specifically to flee the United States. And it, that ended up being a part of the country that was uh, it, it was sold to the United States in the Mexican cessation, uh, the Mexican session. And so that history is 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 much closer to home than uh, Pax Renaissance. And I know people who live on communes and kind of follow this libertarian but also religious fundamentalist polygamist lifestyle. And so some of those footnotes about like natural rights and like if you if you settle on land and improve the land and irrigate the land, you get to own the land. I know people who subscribe to that. It, it, it's very close to home for me. But I love that that game can play with the, these ideas and also toy with, you know, is, is there some sort of labor revolution going on or a back to the roots revolution going on or is it just 
or is it just a banal uh, command of the government? And I love that it can toy with these ideas. And in the end, I think that the reason I can still stomach that game is it, it pretty much makes the opposite argument that Phil seems he mm. think to think he's yeah. making where he he's arguing about like, okay, lack of regulation. And then you play the game and you're going, who would want this? You know, this is, here's the wild this west madness. Who, yeah. This is insane. Nobody can survive this. This is, this is awful. I almost want someone like you, Fred, to go through and write um, alternate footnotes. <laughs> Yes, uh, but I would have to to pick a, a specific game. I think the the Pax Borfiana one would be tricky, but maybe the one that I would be the most comfortable with could be Pax Renaissance. Or the yeah. alternative option is making my own Pax game, which is well, uh, yeah. yeah, indeed. Well, we talked about this. I, I am. Um... I, it was it was interesting you mentioned the personal connections there actually because I was I was thinking then if I would have any with any of these games and and actually the enclosures card that came up in mm. today in Pax, Pax Renaissance you know living in in the UK is this this still feels like something we we see the impact of even hundreds of years later that right. the, the whole the whole kind of social and even physical geography of the country just changed in a very short period of time because of that and you're touching upon something that I that I wanted to talk about which I think is an interesting feature of the Pax game even if it was uh, uh, you're talking about the the geography of of, of the UK of the UK today, but I think the geography of the PAX games mm -hmm. they're all a bit different, uh, and I think the the this one is probably the most literal approach to geography, uh, which Pamir, I, maybe even more so. Yeah, maybe. and oh yeah, Pamir even more so. But I think those two, and but yeah. usually what I like about the PAX game is like the the approach to geography, how abstract it is, but it makes a lot of sense. Like it's psychogeography in a lot of ways. Like things are connected by ideas more or concepts more than 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 physical uh, limitations, which I which I think is 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 interesting. But um, and this one is a, it's a it's a bit more open. Uh, but I. I and I, I know that when we played the Viking one, we really enjoyed it because it was also a great way to show how those, um, it was not only the seas that were important, but also the, the rivers and everything. I think the game does something really strong about, about this. I think in this one, maybe geography is a bit less interesting, but there is the trade roads th thing that yeah. makes it then blow up, which I think is, 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 is really great. It actually gives you a similar perspective to Viking insofar as you 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 look at the land from the sea basically. So yeah. so so what you care about at least when it comes to earning money in uh, this game is 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 these trade routes which go around the sea and and you you find yourself in a position to put a concession on the land and you're like oh but then they're just you know they're just peasants and they're not they're not really traders they're just peasants who might take part in a revolution but are kind of pointless. Um, and what you really want is is these guys on the sea and these big blocks of land are less interesting. That's that's a nice kind of perspective um i think uh, I, I remember i had a question and i forgot about it and now i feel stupid <laughs> <laughs> oh god but uh, yeah I, I guess the another question that i could ask is to 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 both of yours point of view what do you think could make potentially a, a good theme for a, a pax like game well, one one thing actually Dan mentioned about historians not being able to predict history. One really notable example of that is the fall of the Soviet Union, which famously nobody, you know, not even any any social scientists or anything really saw coming. It was, you know, an, an overnight thing. Even just a year before, you had this big symposium on how the Soviet Union would never fall or something like this, and then people are just very embarrassed about it. Um, and I mean, this is something we've we discussed before, Fred. But this kind of chaotic uh, time when there's different people grabbing for power in the in the collapse, so maybe in the early '90s or something, I think is an obvious and interesting kind of set. So just for context, then this is Joe uh, subtly whipping me <laughs> because that's <laughs> that's basically a, a project that I've been uh, researching on for quite a while, and I want to make a, a, a pax like game on the collapse of the USSR. And I said that maybe I would do something about it. And now, I guess now I don't have a choice. I guess that's that's a project <laughs> I have to, to work on right now. But what do you think then? You know, years ago, I was actually conceptualizing a PAX game, which is a little embarrassing because I am not a game designer. But uh, the, the, the idea that I had was um, I, did a, I did some of my master's work on uh, the Merovingian dynasty. Mm. And what had fascinated me about the Merovingians is uh, is just their um, their very unique approach to the division of kingdoms. That they had a material culture was was extremely important. And so, I, what I was conceptualizing was rather than using geography so literally, is um, a Pax game played on a family tree, where mm -hmm. the relationships between characters are what mattered. 
And um, there, I had a whole, I had a whole number of ideas at the time. So specifically, the work that I had been doing at the time was on Merovingian queens, because uh, as as we all know, women often have had to resort to very different approaches to obtaining and maintaining power. And Merovingian queens did all sorts of things uh, to seize and then keep their power. And so I wanted to play a game where you actually played as uh, women like Fredegund, you know, where you are marrying into royal families. And after the king dies, maybe you helped with that, that you're trying to keep power, but basically by using your, your dead husband's treasure. And, um, and it's a fascinating time period. Often uh, the, these women would uh, did in many cases manage to create very significant expressions of power. And um, I never actually got around to designing it. This is just, I think that the PAX model really lends itself well to uh, you know, outsiders. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the hallmarks of a PAX game to me is that you tend to be somebody who's on the outside you know, so um, in Pax Porfiriana, you're the landowner. You are not Porfirio Diaz. Um, or in Pax Pamir, you're not the empires. Or in this game, you are not the ruling class. And so I love this idea of coming from outside a pseudo uh, feudal structure and seeing how you can tinker with the creation of feudalism from the perspective of a woman. So that's, that's an idea that I had had for a long time. And if anybody out there is a game designer, uh, instead of me designing it, I would rather you design it. But what, what, what makes you think you're not a game designer? I'm just, because it's not like, it's not a title that you get from, from the queen or something. It's like it's, it's... <laughs> you know, I, 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 uh, I, I, I just don't have the inclination. Um, I do have, I have other creative outlets. So yeah, that's true. Yeah. And I think it's, and you, yeah. And there is always this, this, I guess, you're always searching for the place where you feel the more comfortable with your creativity. And I, and I guess we, we can say that you probably find a good outlet for it, like based on the, on the quality of, the, of, uh, of your reviews. But um, if you want to send me some notes, I will have a look at it. But uh, as you know, now I have to work on that uh, collapse of the USSR <laughs> packs game. So, so if you can wait for 2025, I can, I can start. Yes, working. right. <laughs> But uh, but I think it's a, it's a, actually a great idea and and but just talking about this like having your both of your point of view on 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 this I think it's also one of the great feature of the of the pack series is that it portrays also from a different perspective but also very different events that we would see in 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 other games because of, of its plasticity you can you can have an event that is quite short or something that spans along a a, a, a wide period of time but still make interesting points about it and. And I mean, when you look at the series, I don't, for all of those games, I almost know no other games that are depicting the same thing. For this one, you said, uh, Here I Stand or Virgin Queen, I guess, but they are radically different approaches and then they are not covering the same scope. This is covering like a, a, a massive scope. For yeah. Pax Pamir, I'm thinking about uh, the great game. That's yeah, there's a couple yeah. of great game kind of games, but yeah. again, they're, they're also, more conventional. In yeah, it's conventional uh, opposition between uh, between the only the Russians and the and the and the British, and I, I think most of the time you actually the local po population are either at events or they are they are objects that you can use in right. play. They are, they don't have agency at all. Pax Porfirana, I know no example a apart from Lords of Sierra Madre, that is also from Philip Clune, and that. Everyone talks about, but no one has played. <laughs> so every, right. every six months, every six months, someone says, um, "Why isn't there a coin game on on the Mexican Revolution?" And then someone else says, "Oh, but there's already Pax Porfiriana." That that's that. That's the end of that. So, yeah, but that's interesting. I think the two systems show very different things, but they they share some of the strength also about showing things on a on a wider range. Um, yeah, having that kind of social aspect and and thinking more about the you know, the role of the population in these conflicts, I think, yeah. I would just say that Cohen has a probably more uh, classical or, or traditional approach to what factions are, which yeah. I would say it's uh, it's very different. But then again, the way those factions interact with the game is a lot richer than um, than than in other historical games. So they both have the, their own strength, but I think that's that's interesting. But I don't think that one should prevent the existing the existence from another. Like there could be a, a Pax game on the on the revolution in Cuba. Like I think that could be that wouldn't be that wouldn't be opposed to for for me that wouldn't be a, 
uh, going against Cuba Libre, for example. I, I don't know. I, yeah. I think there is room for, for both as they are, the systems are sh showing different things, I guess. Yeah. But c can you tell us more then about that uh, prototype that you played or that's still a secret and you're not allowed to talk about it? Oh, um, so the so it's about the uh, Bavarian Illuminati. Mm. Ah, nice. And um, so it's very limited in scope um, because, you know, the Bavarian Illuminati, contrary to rumor, did not take <laughs> over the world. <laughs> and um, and one thing I like about it is you you are playing on kind of an influence grid. So there's no literal geography. It's all about connections between characters. And one of the things that makes it interesting is victory conditions might be based around putting them in a certain arrangement, which, you know, with when you're talking about a group like the Illuminati, which becomes obsessed with like symbols and patterns is such an appropriate uh, expression of that setting, you know, that you, you, that, you know, here you are and your goal ostensibly is to have political influence, but instead what you focus on is like these weird cultic paraphernalia. You know, I, so I've only played it a few times. I haven't seen the uh, the finished product. The designer said he would be sending it to me uh, sometime soon. He's going to be going the self publication route. Mm. But it, but even though it, it's very distinct from the other PAX games, you can see how you know this is a game about outsiders. It's a game about questioning what is agency and what is control, what is power. And so it, it's doing a lot of very interesting things. And we'll see uh, how it goes, especially for a, a solo production without the benefit of a big development team. I always worry about that. But, uh, but so that, those are the details. Um, I would look, yeah, look forward to that. Yeah, I would be curious about this. Um, on the points on development, I think th those games, especially a full-fledged PAX game, with the number of cards that you need for having that balance and then that interest in the in the randomness of the of the of the cards and everything, I think not having a, a developer that that is experienced that you can rely on and everything might be tricky. But I guess we can have a, a really good surprise. And the theme is super interesting. But I think it could be interesting to to see that series being a bit of a in in the same way as the eighteen XX series, seeing like uh, games in the in the same genre pop uh, left and right, but I, I guess that maybe contrary to eighteen XX, it shares they share a lot less commonalities between games. I, I guess that it's as a series they share some. I feel like as a series they share some concepts more than a, a lot of strong mechanics. Apart from the market that is pretty mm -hmm. consistent, and even so. Not that much. If you're thinking about Pax Viking, for example, the market is not exactly the same. You only have one row instead of those classical two rows. I mean, that uh, that one and Transhumanity, I think, are most mechanically yeah. distinct the ones I've I've played. Um, yeah, Transhumanity so and Emancipation both use like they use a similar market that is very different. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's hard to call it a series in a way. What makes it a series is is actually quite interesting. Yes, there is a market, but then it doesn't always work the same. The geography is always a bit different. The actions are different. Just have that idea that you are supposed to take only two actions per 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 turn, and those actions are usually buy a card, sell a card. Those exist all of the time, or uh, buy a card, play a card. But then apart from this, it's actually it's yeah. very diff different. I think it's. If you're thinking about them in terms of mechanical engine, they share between them a lot less similarities than something like Coin that is already pretty yeah. creative uh, in its approach to the series. Um, you know, in, in a way, and I don't mean to cut you off, Fred. In a way, I think that communicates more about how we, in in this uh, in this medium, think about genre. Mm. That, that genre must be mechanical, yeah, rather than a aesthetic. Or even, uh, you know, an ethos, because I think they do have a strong shared ethic. You yes. know that that these are games about redefining power and how outsiders redefine power. They're about watersheds, and I think that you know, you know, we often talk in other genres where you could say, well, these these books are related, mm. um, and they're in a shared genre, even though their settings are totally different or their perspectives are totally different. Uh, the 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 mechanical way they're written or filmed is totally different, but we still understand they're in the sh shared genre. I think it's just fascinating that in this hobby we in almost exclusively define genre mechanically. Yeah, 
Yeah. And, and that's the, the point that, that I that I was thinking about. And I, you're really putting the words on my thoughts. So that, that oh, helps. That's, <laughs> that's, no, that's great. Because I, I, I struggle to find those words. So that's that's good. But I think it's that's what I love about it is that it is a series, undoubtedly. Like you, when you see a PAX game, you know it's a PAX game. But if you ask me what makes it a PAX game, I would be hard pressed to tell you it's about the mechanics. It's about something else. It's about everything that we talked about before, the kind of event that is being portrayed, the kind of actions that you're going to take. And not actions mechanically, but the types of actions, what they are uh, representing, the kind of people that you're playing and what you're trying to do to achieve those things. And I think that makes them way more connected. And, and I was thinking a lot about this because I, I started thinking about like, I'm going to talk about that video again, but the video about historical RPGs, I, I realized that people playing RPGs are way more free when it comes to mechanics and the way they, and I think in a lot of ways in the war game side, even though we all come from the same route, we are very orthodox in our approach to rules. Like you don't make up a rule while you're playing. That's that's a big right. no no. Like that's well, actually, Fred. Actually, Fred. Often when you're demoing your own games and I'm helping you, you 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 will indeed make up a rule uh, because it's a rule that's only in your head. And you say, "Well, I'm the designer, and this is how it goes." And, I go, and you that's hate not it. What it says in book. And yeah, you I hate it when I, I do that. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Yeah, maybe, maybe that proves your point exactly. Yes. Yeah. You yeah. just proved my point. You hate it when I do that. You, I'm not allowed to just create rules as I go, which I want to, and I'm like, why? Not? Not. Uh, and 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 I think it's interesting because in a lot of ways I think the coin games, for example, could share a lot of similarities more in their themes. Um, and in a lot of ways, like there are some games that could borrow some mechanics from it and have nothing to do with a coin game because just the way they are, the factions are they are deciding to portray the kind of factions that you're doing, what is being portrayed is, that has nothing to do with it. And I think I mean, having this more this open, yeah. This, I was just thinking this has happened a little bit with things like Root, which people, people, you know, Cole, Cole has said he's taken at least some inspiration from Coin, mm. but obviously it's extremely different mechanically. But but people still say sometimes like, oh, this is like Coin for a general market, and that's you know, if you're thinking mechanically, that's just not true. No, you, that's no, that's you not, know, you're, yeah. you're you're not going to learn how to play Coin at all playing Root. But but maybe in terms of this kind of genre idea, there's some there's some truth to that. Um, there's this kind of broader idea of genre anyway mm. to do with themes and, and this kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I think it is. I think it is. Very interesting. I didn't expect the discussion to go in that direction. But anyway, I promise that we won't take too too long. And I think it was a, a, a great chat. I must say then thank you very much for 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 coming on the show and, and showing us uh, Pax Renaissance for that teach and play. Um, and I hope that the people who are um, uh, watching, if you if you have uh, Pax Renaissance on your shelf and you still haven't put it on the table, I hope that this will help you. Uh, put it there and yeah I think it was really interesting discussion I would be very happy to have you again on the show for talking about I think having more depending on the topics that we can see but I think having more general discussion about maybe not a specific game but could be like thinking about about the hobby in like on a specific topic uh, uh, like maybe some of those panels that we have when we talk about ethics and stuff like this could be could be I would be really happy to 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 have you for one of those uh one of those discussions, but it was really cool. Joe, once again, thanks for 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 being here. I'm happy that for once you didn't, uh, uh, because normally my, my games with Joe go like this. Uh, I, I I just get bullied during the whole game, and he ends up winning, and I'm really sad. And he wins on my head, like literally. I just so that's that's like I was his pedestal to victory. That's always the way it goes, and I'm happy it didn't happen this time. Uh, but uh, but it was still a loss. But it was the a, a sweeter kind of loss. <laughs> I think I think I lost more than you, so that's fine. Yeah, so that's okay, I guess. Yeah. Well, Good. thank you so much for having me on. This was lovely. Yeah, it was great. But have a great day, Joe. Have a good night, and uh, and see you soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Right.